Hello there, I'm Black Bright, broadcasting out the UK. Welcome to my channel. Um, today I decided to clarify, what is it, is the word clarify? Um, share with you um, the emergency legislation to do with COVID-19. Um, I think I did a video that kind of covered it before, but it was based on somebody else's interpretation or based on TDLR's um, input. But this one, I've actually gone to the government website and I've decided to kind of share it with you and then put my two cents worth in because I feel a bit more familiar with it when I read it myself. I think it's really important that the majority of you know what it says and um, how to react to it or relate to it. I shouldn't say react. React is not a good word. React means that you are being irrational, whereas being proactive and Reading it with a sense of um, responsibility and control is much more beneficial for our well-being and everything else. So if you want to subscribe, you can. If you want to share, you can. If you want to put the thumbs up, you can. And if you want to put the thumbs down, you can. You can also interact with my subscribers and welcome on board if it's the first time you're passing through. So the UK's Coronavirus Action Plan. It was published on the 3rd of March 2020 and set out measures to respond to COVID-19 outbreak that are reasonable and proportionate and based on the latest scientific evidence. Um, reasonable and proportionate. I always have my um, reservation about words like that because it's always reasonable to what degree and in relation to what and proportionate for the same reason. What's proportionate for one person is not proportionate for another. Like when they use proportionate force. For some people, proportionate force is reasonable force. For some people, the proportionate force is excessive force. So when they're talking about reasonable and proportionate, it depends on whose eyes or whose frame, frame of reference they are referring to. So specifically it detailed what we want what we know about the virus and the disease it causes, how the government have planned for an infectious disease outbreak, what the government are planning to do next, depending on the course the coronavirus outbreak takes, and the role the public can play in supporting this response now and in the future. The plan also includes information, the government's four-stage strategy, contain, delay, research, and mitigate. It sets out advice for how the public should respond in each stage, including what to, what to expect as the outbreak advances. It also envisages that changes to legislation might be necessary in order to give public bodies across the UK the tools and powers they need to carry out an effective response to this emergency. And this paper sets out, subject to final approval, the elements of the bill and the reasons why they're needed. Um, so the changes in legislation, so what I'm saying now, it can change as and when. So it's not written in stone at this point. The development of an effective response to the epidemic requires a number of actions. Some of these involve the use of tools and powers that are set out in statute. The government of the UK therefore resolved to review and, where necessary, amend the legislation to ensure that the UK's response is consistent and effective. The only thing is, I don't see how it can be consistent and effective if it keeps changing and they keep moving the goalpost. I don't understand how the consistency factors in there. Easing the burden on frontline front NHS and adult social care staff, some help staff by enabling them to work without financial penalty. For me, that's death by decision and no penalty for error because they are now being given the decision whether someone lives and whether someone dies, basically, because of the priorities and because of who is more sick and goodness knows what else. The legislation will be time limited for two years and not all of these measures will come into force immediately. 
The only thing I don't understand is why is it for two years? China, they've um, they got over their pandemic in three months. I think Italy has gone over the curb within three months. And I'm not quite sure where Spain and France is with the curve, but they're looking at, I believe, with, with between three and six months. So I don't understand why an emergency plan that is so extreme has to be in place for two years. That's my only concern. It's a very, very long time to give the police those extra powers to just literally do what they want, go where they want. So that's my only concern, why it has to be for two years. Um, the bill allows for four UK governments to switch on these new powers when they are needed. So while on the one hand, the government is saying that the UK's response must be consistent and effective by switching powers on and off as necessary, as appropriate, and can amend and review where necessary, and there is no prototype to follow, it means... That, that is not, there will be no consistency. That is not consistency. So, and crucially, to switch them off again once they're no longer necessary based on advice of the chief medical officers of the four, na um, four nations. And that could be indefinitely, couldn't it, really? The measures in the coronavirus bill are temporary, proportionate to the threat we face will only be used when strictly necessary and be in place for as long as required to respond to the situation. I really hope that's the way it works out. I mean, we can't envisage how long it's going to take, but I really hope it's just as long as is necessary. And it's not, you know, kind of dragged out. Uh, the problem with this statement that it is all relative is quite arbitrary. If most countries have seen a curve after three months, why is it necessary to have this emergency bill in place for two years? Is it because they envisage the next sweep of, of the coronavirus and they want to make sure they have something in place so they don't have to do all of this over again? So an emergency bill for two years tells me that this country might not get back on her feet for two years or the impact of what is happening will last around two years. So that's not very reassuring, is it? I'm hoping that I'm wrong. Um, as I always say, I, I, when I comment, it's just my opinion. Um, it's not fact. It's just I, what I do is I read. I took this from the www.gov.uk website, and so the information is authentic. And then what I do is I give my little two pence worth in as and when I feel the need. OK, the bill enables action in five areas, increasing the available the first one, increasing the available health and social care work, workforce, for example, by removing barriers to allow recently retired NHS staff and social workers to return. And in Scotland, in addition to retired people, allowing those who are on a career break or our social worker students to become temporary social workers, which I interpret that to mean allowing unqualified staff, i.e. student social workers, to be temporarily qualified. And hence the indemnity policy, relieving them of any financial liability, I would think. I mean, they are saying that these students are in like their final, final year or the final couple of months and so maybe ordinarily they would have completed their studies in June July if we didn't have the lockdown so they are more or less qualified but they just don't have the certificate yet but I understand they've got um, systems in place which will give them the certificate and qualify them. Um, number two easing the burden on frontline staff by reducing the number of administrative tasks that they have to perform enabling local authorities to prioritize care for people with the most pressing needs allowing key workers to perform more tasks remotely and with less paperwork and take the power to suspend individual port operations which could be defined as suspending all policies and reforms and regulations that influence the infrastructure and operations including those at the ports and the airports, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, 
Number three, containing and slowing the virus, what is otherwise known as mitigation. By reducing unnecessary social contacts, for example, through powers over events and gatherings and strengthening quarantine powers of police and immigration officers, which means, this is my bet, that police officers will be given powers to arrest and isolate people in order to protect public health under the new rules. Oh no, that is that is what was written. That is actually the government part, which means that police officers will be given power to arrest and isolate people in order to protect public health under new rules. But isolate them to where? Um, it doesn't suggest that they'll be going into those hospitals, but maybe they are. Um, it also means that clinicians caring for a patient with confirmed COVID-19 have a set list of information to collect, including where the patient visited and who they've spent time with, such as fellow travellers or family members. And using that information, anyone deemed to be a risk is contacted by PHE, I think that's public health something or other, and given health advice as well as who, who to phone if symptoms do show up. In short, if you've been hanging around with confirmed COVID-19 cases, expect the PHE to be in touch. So, so supposing you've gone out with somebody over the weekend, well, you're not supposed to be going out anyway, but just supposing you have been out before, okay, before the lockdown, then say about 12 days ago, and um, somebody that there's gone into hospital, has caught COVID, has caught the coronavirus, and they, um, and subsequently dies, or even if they don't die, they'll go through their phone and they'll see who they've been in contact with recently, maybe through um, WhatsApp or whatever, they, whatever the method they use, to see who they've been in contact with recently. I'm sure if, if it's just a WhatsApp and they haven't physically seen each other there won't be that necessity but if they've put in that whatsapp oh look i'm going to meet you on friday or we'll meet up or thanks for thanks for meeting up with me on such and such a day and it's within that latency period um then they could call you because you could also have contracted the the virus so um also with regard to that whatsapp they're um, changing it from five people that you can send one mess up, one message to, to just one. You can now only share one message at a time. I think it takes effect sometime in May, um, if I remember rightly. But yeah, instead of five, you can only share it with one. I don't think people are bothered, to be honest. And that's because of the 5G fear mongering. They feel that because people have been sharing stuff and they're sharing it too quickly, um, they want to shut it down so that it doesn't spread so quickly. I mean, somebody could literally, if they've got all day, sit at home just sending one, 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 one. So it's not going to really make that much difference. But I guess if they're sending one at a time more than as opposed to five at a time, it's more trackable. And also, if you are sending it to one person at a time, it means you are being more deliberate in sharing that information, as opposed to if you sent it to five people, you could always say, oh, I didn't realise that that blah, blah, blah. OK, so this virus is not aerosol spread. I mean, we, we hear one, one person like Dr. Anthony Fauci. He's saying that, you know, you cough, you sneeze, aerosol spread, you can catch the virus. There's somebody called Barat Pancania. He's a public health lecturer at University of Exeter. He says the virus is not aerosol spread. So to me, that means if you sneeze or something, you can't catch it. I don't know. You hear such conflicting information. You don't know what's real from what's not. That's why, you know, I can understand um, the concern on, you know, the spreading of fake news and fear-mongering, and perpetuating the fear. So 
In other words, you are only at risk if you are in close contact within two metres and only if that case was coughing and spluttering. So basically what this doctor is saying is that, OK, if you're within two metres and somebody's coughing and spluttering, then you could get it. But, you know, when they was talking about the six feet and the 11 feet and how if you do a really vigilant sneeze, it, it will it will just aerosol out and anybody within that kind of parameter could catch it. What this 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 doctor is refuting it. So we don't really know. I still think it's better to be safe than sorry. They still think it's better to have a mask and get as far as possible from people, especially those who are coughing and spluttering. Number four, managing the deceased with respect and dignity by enabling the death management system to deal with increased demands for its services. So um, I interpret that to mean there, there might not be any respect and dignity for the dying, but only for those who are actually doing the process because they are overrun, for more or less for the people facilitating the process. Um, supporting people by allowing them to claim statutory sick pay from day one and by supporting the food industry to maintain supplies. This is a good plan in theory, um, i.e. allowing them to, to claim statutory sick pay straight away. But how long does it take to get through to universal credit in order to make that claim? That's if that, that's if that is the mechanism that they have to use for statutory sick pay. I would assume that it is. I would assume you'd have to stick in, you know, you'd go online and register and all that kind of stuff. And guess how many people have applied for universal credit in two weeks? 950,000. 950,000. So what I'm saying is, yeah, it's fine in principle um, to say, oh, yeah, you can get your sickness pay from day one. But how long are you going to wait to get through on that line? And then you have to wait five weeks after that to get the money. So, um, yeah, the Salvation Army has warned that advanced payments must be given as grants, not loans, to prevent a coronavirus debit crisis. Yeah, because what's going to happen is these people go and sick, go, are sick, they claim and... Um, if they have to pay it back and they don't have any money as it is, it is going to create a debt crisis. So also they're easing the burden on frontline staff, both within the NHS and beyond in the NHS and in other sectors who undertake activities that are vital to keeping the country running safely and securely. The government may also face particular increased pressures as a result of staff absences or increased work volumes. This could include those caring for children or in education, protecting our borders, detaining and treating people under the Mental Health Act, supporting local authorities and ensuring national security by reducing the number of admin tasks that they have to perform, allowing key workers to perform more tasks remotely and with less paperwork. Government will enable these crucial services to continue to operate effectively during periods of reduced staffing. And to support and to do this, the bill seeks to enable existing mental health legislation powers to detain and treat patients who need urgent treatment for a mental health disorder and are at risk to themselves or others to be implemented using just one doctor's opinion rather than the current two, before it was two. But now they'll only need one. So if one person says you're off your rocker, you're off your rocker. There's no second opinion. OK, this will ensure that those who are at risk to themselves or others would still get the treatment they need with fewer doctors, when fewer doctors are available to undertake this function. Uh, also, temporarily allow extension or removal of time limits in mental health legislation to allow for greater flexibility where services are less able to respond, which technically means, you know, normally, say, for example, you're going into a mental health institution and they say they're going to keep you for three to six months, that's going to be lifted. 
there's not going to be any designated time frame for the detention in a mental health institution. Well, that's my interpretation of that. And these temporary changes would be brought in only in the instance that staff members were severely adversely affected during the pandemic period and provide some flexibility to help support the continued safe running of the services under the Mental Health Act. So, um, also, allow NHS providers to delay undertaking the assessment pro process for NHS continuing healthcare for individuals being discharged from hospital under the emergency until after the emergency period has ended. So any kind of assessments will be done when things kind of ease off. Um, they're making changes to the Care Act 2014 in England and Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act 2014 to enable local authorities to prioritise the services they offer in order to ensure that the most urgent and serious care needs are met, even if this means not meeting everyone's assessed needs in full or delaying some assessments. During a pandemic, a lot of people who work in health and social care could be off sick or may need to care for loved ones. This could mean that local authorities, which are responsible for social care, may not be able to do all the things that they usually require to do. So there's going to be a suspension so that they are not having to stress about what they have been able to do and what they can't. So they're going to temporarily relax local authority duties to conduct a needs assessment. Um, there's requirements around education legislation, port and airport operators temporarily close and suspend operations if border force staff shortages result in a real and significant threat to the UK border security. So basically, they're just going to relax some of the legislation so that people aren't under so much pressure when they've got other things to do. They're going to expand the availability of video and audio link in court procedures, such that the Treasury can transact its business at all times by making it possible for a single commissioner or single Treasury Minister to sign instruments and act on behalf of the commissioners during the COVID-19 emergency period, allowing temporary judicial commissioners to be appointed at the request of the Investigatory Powers Commissioner in the event that there are insufficient JCs available to operate the system under the Investigatory Powers Act 2016. So um, it looks like some of the court hearings are going to be done by video link. I mean, at work, it seems to be working pretty well. I'm not quite sure how, if you're in a courtroom, like ordinarily, if you're in a court and you're sitting in front of a judge, it's a totally different dynamic than if you are on a video link. I don't think that um, you're going to get... I mean, you won't be able to build any rapport at all, I don't think. That's out of the window. Um, normally, um, a judge would be able to check your body language to see whether or not you're innocent. They, they sense that you're innocent or guilty. They can t sense if you're nervous. They can, you know... And when you're in a courtroom with a lot of people, I think you kind of feel more protected. You've got more people listening to what you're saying. You've got more people to evidence what you're saying. So you can feel a bit more secure. But I would imagine video conferencing, if it's just you, the, a couple of um, trainee, judicial, whatever they're called, it's JCs, judicial commissioners. You've just got a couple of those in a room and yourself and um, no one else could kind of, you could feel quite vulnerable because it's it's not many people so um that's what i would think i would think i would feel if i was if i had to go to court and it was just me a couple of um, jc's and a judge and there was no you know like when you What's Judge Judy? I love Judge Judy. And you've got people in the 
like they I think they have a, they're an audience anyway, but you still have people like you would have a jury, wouldn't you, if you go to court? All of that you wouldn't have. So it's more or less your word against theirs. So I don't think I'd feel comfortable with that video conferencing in a court scenario. But that's the way they're going to go in order to deal with the amount that they envisage having. So this is one of the critical pieces of domestic legislation for national security. It creates the statutory basis for the use of the investigatory powers by the intelligence and law enforcement agencies using warrants issued under the Act. These warrants provide the agencies with the capability they need to protect national security and investigate and prevent serious crime. The Home Office, again, at the request of the Investigatory Powers Commissioner, will also be allowed to vary the time allowed for urgent warrants to be reviewed by a JC and how long they can last before they need to be reviewed. The maximum time allowed for a review will be increased to a maximum of 12 days, up from the current three days, maintaining national security capabilities at a time of potential widespread upheaval is critical and it is necessary to ensure that the powers to vary specific aspects of the regime are available to the government should they be deemed necessary. For example, if there are fewer JCs available than usual. So they're trying to offer a lot of flexibility with this new bill. And, um, yeah. Delaying and slowing the virus, people to reduce unnecessary social contacts. That's the what we call the social distancing, self-isolating, quarantine, whatever you want to call it. Um, so delaying the slowing of the virus, people to reduce unnecessary social contacts, what they call it once again, mitigations. Enable the government to restrict or prohibit events and gatherings during the pandemic in any place, vehicle, train, vessel or aircraft, any movable structure and any offshore installation and, where necessary, to close premises, provide a temporary power to close educational establishments or child care providers, postpone the local mayoral, mayoral, mayoral yeah, and police and crime commissioners elections that were due to take place in England in May this year until May 2021. So it's going to be deferred. Elections will be deferred for a year. Provision will also be made to postpone other electoral events over the course of the year, such as by election. Well, that's where we differ from the United States because I believe their elections are still taking place. I wonder if they're going to do them online in America. Hmm. Managing the deceased with respect and dignity. This will take account of the fact that families who have lost a loved one may be self-isolating and that there may be reduced capacity to register and manage deaths as a result of the pandemic-related sickness absence. The bill intends to make changes to mean, to, mean, to mean a corona is only to be notified where a doctor believes there is no medical practitioner who may sign the death certificate or that they are not available within a reasonable time of death. So they don't need any co co coroners. And the only time they're going to notify a coroner is when there's no medical practitioner to sign off the death certificate. OK, they're going to introduce powers to enable the provisions under the Burial and Cremation Scotland Act 2016 relating to the collection of ashes to be suspended and replaced with a duty to retain until the suspension is lifted, except where a family wishes are known. Also, suspend an offence in Section 49 of the 2016 Act, allowing any relative of the deceased to complete the cremation application form, regardless of the required hierarchy set out by Section 65 of the 2016 Act. Now, what is that 2016 Act? Oh, I wonder if 
that's the Investigatory Powers Act. But what would that have to do with death, if it is that one? Anyway, you might want to um, look into that. Um, I don't know whether it's the Investigatory Powers Act 2016 that gives um, them license to suspend. And I think, I'm not quite sure whether this means families who want to cremate their dead can't unless they've got specific instructions or I'm assuming that if you don't, if, the, if who they pick up doesn't have a will, but are they going to have time to go and investigate whether somebody's got a will? And it's not like somebody's going to be walking around with a will. And if you can't go to the hospital and you can't follow up to the degree that you'd want to because, you know, they're telling you you can't phone the hospital, you can't go to the hospital. So you can't follow up. So I don't see how they're going to get to know what the deceased wishes are in a crisis. How are they going to know what the deceased wishes are? And I think what this is saying to me is that in because of the crisis, it looks like they can introduce powers to enable the provisions under the Burial and Cremation Scotland Act to... Oh, is that... Oh, it's right there, isn't it? It's not the Investigatory Powers Act. It's the Burial and Cremation Scotland Act 2016. So it's Section 49 of that Act. I don't know if it just relates to Scotland, since Scotland is in brackets, so it might not relate to the UK. Relating to the collection of ashes to be suspended. Ah, OK. I'm glad I read it again. Because sometimes I read things and, you know, my head goes way off. So basically, it's just that they'll probably be cremated. But the collection of their ashes is to be suspended until the crisis suspends. So I can imagine it'd be really hard to monitor people's ashes and whose ashes belong to who when they've got so many deaths. I think that is what it's talking about except for where family wishes are known. So I guess if somebody dies and they immediately call and let them know what their wishes are, they can then implement whatever they need to implement. That's my understanding. Could be off. You know me. Go off in my little tandems. Okay, and expand the list of people who can register a death to include funeral directors acting on behalf of the family. Enable electronic transmission of documents that currently have to be physically presented in order to certify the registration of death. So you're going to get electronic means um, death certificate, I think. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to enable electronic transmissions of documents that currently have to be physically. So ordinarily, you know, ordinarily you would to prove a death certificate if you need to take over someone's accounts or whatever, they you will be allowed to have an electronic version that will serve just as well as a hard copy in these circumstances. And I guess that's what you would use for the will, uh, for to take to your solicitor, to the banks, or whoever you need to take it to. Okay, so I'm getting there, nearly finished. I'm sure you must have switched me off and gone and got yourself a coffee or a glass of wine by now. Okay, I won't keep you much longer. So, um, remove the need for a secondary, a second confirmatory medical certificate in order for a cremation to take place. So maybe ordinarily you need a second certificate uh, for cremation to take place. That is no longer necessary. It looks like they'll be satisfied with one. Remove the Coroners and the Justice Act 2009 requirement that any inquest into COVID-19 death must be held with a jury. Other notifiable diseases will still require an inquest. 
with a jury. Um, okay, suspend the referral of certificates to the Death Certi Certification Review Service, DCRS, for review in Scotland under the Certification of Death Scotland Act 2011. The timing of the suspension to be at the discretion of the Scottish Minister. So this is all to do with Scotland. If the scientific advice indicates that the number of people who might die from COVID-19 is likely to significantly exceed the capacity locally to manage the deceased and other contingency measures have been deployed. Local government will have the ability to take control of a component or components of the death management management process in their area. This is exhausting. How much pages have I got left? I haven't got much now. Okay, so basically the family of the dead have no say in whatsoever unless it is under the act above, which I couldn't find. So for example, local authorities may choose to direct local actors such as funeral directors, mortuaries, mortuary owners, crematoriums, owners and others to streamline the death management process. This may include an increase in the operating times of crematoriums, directing companies to use their vehicles to move bodies, or directing others not directly involved in the funeral sector to provide necessary support. So, um, only in the most extreme conditions where there is a risk to public health would the powers of direction be used and only be used when scientific evidence and operational advice suggest that it is necessary. But they add, personal choice will be respected as far as possible, especially in regard to how we had loved ones after they have passed. Protecting, one more page, protecting and supporting people. And I'm going to say this a bit faster. I'm going to up my tempo. We are asking people to stay at home if they have a high temperature or a new and continuous cough, or if anyone in their household has one of the two symptoms. In the event of a wider outbreak of COVID-19, the number of people that would be off work would increase significantly. This would include those that were displaying virus-like symptoms, and those who were self-isolated as a precautionary measure. The bill is therefore seeking to give the government the power to temporarily suspend the rule that means SSP, statutory sickness pay, is not paid for the first three days of work that you miss because of sickness. These days are known as waiting days. Lifting this rule will enable us to respond quickly to an outbreak, enabling employers with fewer than 250 employees to reclaim SSP, paid for sickness absences related to coronavirus during the period of the outbreak. This is because the government wants to ensure that businesses are supported to deal with the temporary economic impacts of the outbreak of the coronavirus. And last but not least, require industry to provide information about food supplies in the event that an industry partner does not cooperate with their current voluntary information sharing arrangements during a period of potential disruption. Potential disruption? I thought the disruption was already here, but what does that mean? Require industry to provide information about food supplies. Does that mean that some businesses might be stockpiling, and if they are stockpiling, they need to cooperate with current voluntary information sharing arrangements. So I guess they are supposed to let people know exactly what they have with regard to food supplies. That's all I can think of. Now, it wasn't that long and arduous, but it saves you reading all of the, I think it's 329 pages. I've just taken out the main stuff. And like I said, if you want to have a look, um, it's www.gov.uk. And... Um, yeah, if you just search for emergency powers, COVID-19, it will come up on the government website. So I hope you found it useful. And that's all for now. Bye-bye.